A reading from the first book of Kings. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the whole community of Israel, and stretching forth his hands toward heaven, he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You keep your covenant of mercy with your servants, who are faithful to you with their whole heart. Can it indeed be that God dwells on earth? If the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Look kindly on the prayer and petition of your servant, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry of supplication which I, your servant, utter before you this day. May your eyes watch night and day over this temple, the place where you have decreed you shall be honored. May you heed the prayer which I, your servant, offer in this place. Listen to the petitions of your servant and of your people Israel, which they offer in this place. Listen from your heavenly dwelling and grant pardon. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. My soul yearns and pines for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest in which she puts her young. Your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. Blessed they who dwell in your house, continually they praise you. O God, behold our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. I had rather one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I had rather lie at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord mighty God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Pharisees with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things they have traditionally observed, the purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes questioned him, Why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, Well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, As is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. He went on to say, How well you have set aside the commandment of God in order to uphold your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever curses father or mother shall die. Yet you say, If someone says to father or mother, Any support you might have had from me is korban, meaning dedicated to God, you allow him to do nothing more for his father or mother. You nullify the word of God in favor of your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many such things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The lessons of these readings are critically important. Church buildings and tradition. Solomon stood before the altar in the temple, 
God commanded the temple to be built. He give, gave detailed instructions. In fact, well before the temple, God gave detailed instructions about the tabernacle. When God's people were journeying through the desert, there was a portable dwelling place of God, if you will, a portable structure that they took with them, carefully built according to God's instructions. It was the center piece of God's presence among his people, of prayer, of his dwelling with them. And then, of course, as the commandments were given, the Ark of the Covenant, again, a box carefully made by God's instruction, carried around with the people, God's presence dwelling with them. And even before that, you go back to the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, and at different times, in order to memorialize the presence and action of God, stones were set up to mark different places, physical manifestations of the worship of the spiritual God were clearly appropriate and commanded by the Lord. Why? Well, because of, because of this. We are physical, not just spiritual. We're a combination of both as human beings. And that's, that's the answer. That's, that's the, the, the reason. We are a, because we are a combination of both the spiritual and the physical, so our worship of God is a combination of the physical and the spiritual. We worship God not like the angels do. They're pure spirits. We worship God in both ways, physical and spiritual. And God understands that because that's how he made us. And he wants that. He wants that. So we see the, the, his commandments throughout uh, the history of uh, Scripture putting importance on the physical temple. Jesus worshipped in the temple. The even, Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple 40 days after his birth to carry out the customary ritual of the law. They didn't disregard it. Now, Jesus also said to the Samaritan woman that true, worshiper, true worshipers of him would worship in spirit and in truth. See, that's where we understand that while the physical structure of church buildings helps us as human beings to engage our senses in the worship of God, sight, beautiful structures, lifting the spirit up to the heavens as the spires of the church point upwards, the, the beauty that meets the eye in, in, in religious artwork, the even the sense of smell with the, the sweet incense, the sweet fragrance, as Scripture tells us, of our prayers arising before God. Even though all these things are important, we understand God is spirit and he dwells everywhere. So the fact that we have a church that symbolizes, well, actually it symbolizes, first of all, God who became flesh. Remember, God became physical. That's why Christian worship is also physical. God became physical. And, um, but we also know that he's everywhere. So the, 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 the existence of the of importance of the physical worship doesn't make us forget that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. And so Jesus said, don't put absolute value on the physical structure. People who worship me must worship in spirit and in truth. There needs to be an obedience, an openness of the heart, and an interior union with God, whom we worship in the physical buildings. We don't say either or. We say both and. Now, you go to Jeremiah 7, the temple sermon. It's a great lesson about this, too. And this is the, the, the um, mistake that Jesus is. We'll get to this gospel passage in a moment where Jesus is correcting them. They go into the temple, many of the people did, and they said, well, because this is the temple of the Lord, we can come in here and worship, but then when we go out, we can continue to commit whatever sins we want to commit. And Jeremiah was very, very strong against that and said, no, 
You can't just say, this is the temple of the Lord and we can go out and sin. The Lord will come in here and destroy this temple and you. And of course, that's what did happen. The Babylonians came in as an instrument of God's punishment for the infidelity of his people, and they ended up destroying the temple. The point is, the existence of the physical structure does not take away our duty to worship him by our interior adherence to his will, obedience to his commands, embracing of his indwelling grace. And this is the proper, also the proper balance here between tradition and, again, infidelity to God. Jesus here is talking about traditions that people carry out thinking that those traditional practices are what is making them acceptable to God while their heart is far from Him. It's the rosary beads hanging from the uh, dashboard of the person who's driving into the abortion clinic to have their baby killed. Does anyone who's devoted to the rosary think that, that the fact that the rosaries are hanging there absolves that person from the responsibility to care for their child rather than to have their child killed? You, you, you can't, you know, or it's like the person getting the ashes on Ash Wednesday, which we want people to come. You know, sometimes people that are not coming to church, that ends up being the, one of their only connections with the church. And so we eagerly welcome to church on Ash Wednesday those who are not gone there the rest of the year. But we don't want them to think that getting the ashes absolves them from going the rest of the year. No. We want them there, but we want them there every Sunday. So Jesus is talking about traditions that go against the worship of God. He's not talking about traditions that reinforce the worship of God. The, the, the very word traditio, what is handed on, Jesus indeed is, is, is illustrating that in this very passage. He's quoting from Isaiah. The prophecy of Isaiah is handed on. In Latin, that is traditio. The, he quotes Moses and the commandments. They are handed on. That is traditio. St. Paul, we just read the other day from 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I preached to you, I handed on to you, traditio is the word, what I myself received, what was traditio to me. So the word of God itself is handed on from generation to generation. So it's not tradition in that sense that Jesus is talking against. It's the conflict between tradition and the Word of God. Just like it is not physical buildings that Jesus is saying are unimportant, He's saying, do not think that the physical worship absolves you of your internal obedience to God. So let's keep a balanced view, brothers and sisters, of all these things. Let's see what Jesus is really saying and correcting us against abuses, but not throwing out the tools that he gives us to worship him. Thank you, Lord, for the sacred tradition of the word of God. Thank you for the physical buildings that remind us of your spiritual presence within us and around us everywhere. Thank you, Lord God, for the obedience to you and the holiness as we serve you, as we choose life, as we defend life, as we are become the people of life Thank you, Lord, for keeping us firm in the tradition of the teaching that you yourself give us. Amen.